Calls have gone out for action to fight climate change after Monday's dire report by a UN science panel. An activist, Greta Thunberg, says she plans to go this year's to go to this year's global climate conference in Glasgow, Scotland. After all, the major UN conference will test countries' ambition to limit global warming. And a landmark scientific report on Monday warned it was dangerously close to escalating beyond the limits countries agreed on. We're not talking about the fact that 2021 is currently projected to be the year with the second highest annual emission rise ever. Um, that's not something that, if you if you read like newspapers today, it seems like people are doing something. Uh, countries are presenting net zero targets like decades into the future, and we are taking action. Uh, that's not really the case, though. If you look at the reality, so we we need to. That's what we need to be talking about. Of course, only, also talking about the people who are suffering from the consequences today. But the only way that we can prevent these symptoms from happening is to actually go to the root cause. Just what to do. It doesn't say you have to do this and then you have to do this. It doesn't provide us with such solutions or tell us that you need to do this. And that's up for us. We are the ones who need to take to take the decisions. And we are the ones who need to be brave and ask the the difficult questions to ourselves like what do we value um are we ready to take action to to ensure future and present living conditions so i hope that this can be a wake-up call and that it really gives perspective and that it once again can be a reminder that the climate crisis has not gone away it's only escalating and it's only growing more intense by the hour And joining us live from Boston in the United States of America is Rachel Kite. She's the Dean of the Fletcher School of Tufts University. Thank you very much for joining us, Rachel. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Great. Um, it's very interesting that, you know, what's happening around us is very serious. But unfortunately, a lot of people do not necessarily understand or even agree that there's anything like climate change. How do you deal with you know, people not knowing or embracing or understanding what climate change really is? Well, it's a good point. For 40 years now, the science has been warning us that this is happening. It's going to happen sooner. It's, it's coming faster than we predict. And here we have with this report, after 40 years, uh, unequivocal consensus amongst thousands and thousands of scientists pulling together all kinds of different ways of assessing the science that we are causing this problem, that if we stop emitting harmful carbon pollution into the atmosphere, we can actually slow and stop warming. That's something that they haven't said before. Um, and therefore, we need to do something about it. So I think with fires and droughts, uh, the impact that's having on food, the impact that's having on people moving, having to be forcibly displaced around the world, that more and more and more we can see we're living right in the middle of it now. You talk to any farmer in any village in any country in the world, they'll tell you that the climate is changing. Uh, and so now we need the political leadership to act in response to the science. Well, I mean, it's clear that in, in Nigeria, we're really backwards when it comes to, you know, dealing with climate change. And like I said, for a lot of people, um, they still feel that it's an act of God or, um, you know, the flooding is, you know, a sort of force of nature of sorts. But then I was just saying to someone earlier today, we still are not recycling as much as we should. We're still not um, clearing our drainages. We're not, we're emitting all kinds of harmful substances into the atmosphere. Um, and so what, how much education is out there for countries that are not um, like the US or the UK? I mean, even the UK is still struggling with some emissions. Uh, but, but countries like Nigeria and the rest of the world who do not have the kind of information that everybody else has, what form of education is out there for people to embrace this? Because it's becoming more realistic than we used to think of it. Well, here's, here's one way to think about it for, for anybody watching who thinks that maybe this is just, uh, you know, God uh, uh, and, and outside of our control, is that we've always had droughts, we've always had floods, We've always had extreme weather events, but the human impact is that we're now having them more frequently. And when they come, they are more intense. 
So the heat is getting hotter. The rains are getting more intense in shorter periods of time. And that is us. The science is saying that's us. That's human beings. That's humanity. So we're making the climate, which has always varied, much, much more dangerous. And that's the education that I think is needed together with, well, so then what can we do? And the scientific report doesn't tell us what to do, but it clearly points to the things that we know already. One, we have to just cut emissions. Two, especially in the next decade, cut methane. Well, for Nigeria, methane emissions out of the gas infrastructure that the country has, anything that can limit that will make the world a safer place. We need to protect nature. We need nature to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So every time we destroy a forest, it makes that less likely. So we need to stop deforestation. Now, these are things that we've known that we need to do. We now just need to do them urgently. Interesting. Um, There is, I mean, you mentioned something that's really interesting, which is deforestation. It's a big problem here. Um, Most Mm -hmm. of the farmers seem to, you know, do some form of bush burning before they start planting season, which has also resulted to wildfires. But but let's let's come back to um, the issue of us realizing that we all have a role to play in dealing with the issues. In Nigeria, we're, we've started having our flash floods and the rains are here, it's rainy season. And so the flooding is everywhere. Of course, the water levels are going to also go up. Um, for the United States and other countries, there seems to be a climate agreement of sorts. I do not know how many African countries are signatories to that agreement. So every country agreed to the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, including every African country. And then the United States stepped out of the agreement and stepped back in again with a change in administrations from President uh, Obama to Trump and then to Biden. So every country is in. Every country needs to file a report with the UN every few years saying how it's going to act for its own economy, for its own people to take more ambitious action. And the Nigerian government has filed its report with the UN this summer. I think this very, we should be very clear, the burden of responsibility is on the highly polluting countries. So the first order of business is that the United States, the European Union, China, Japan, the industrialized, the G20 countries, that they really have to come with much more ambitious plans to cut their emissions and to provide financing to help other countries cut their emissions and move on to a greener pathway. But every African country signed, and in fact, Africa has constantly, the African countries have constantly pushed countries to be more ambitious. And when we all meet in November at the next climate talks, it will be Africa's voice which will be important because there needs to be financial flows into the economies of Africa so that they can grow greener. We have to be able to help African farmers adapt to this warmer and more uh, intense uh, weather environment that we have. And we have to uh, find lots of exciting jobs for uh, the young Africans that we're, who have a future ahead of them, a future ahead of them in new technologies that use less uh, fuel, the the renewable energy possibilities that the African continent has. So this isn't necessarily doom and gloom. There's huge opportunity there. And Africa has to demand that other countries take their responsibilities and act quickly. One last question. Um, As much as, you know, we appreciate the fact that there are green cars, this green energy, um, alternative sources of energy, we're beginning to, um, you know, have access to them in Nigeria. We're beginning to look at those alternatives, but they're very expensive for the average person. And don't forget that the the lowest person in Nigeria lives below a dollar per day. So if we're incorporating this green energy, you know, um, protecting our biodiversity, keeping on um, untapped rainforests the way they are, um, people still need to use kerosene for their stoves because that's what they can afford. There are people who need to turn on their generators because we do not have 24 hours power in Nigeria. Um, so do you see this going away anytime soon? Because it's very difficult to um, try to talk that kind of person out of using those things because they cannot uh, afford other alternative sources of energy. No, absolutely. So every Nigerian should be able to access clean, affordable and reliable energy, just like every other African, like everybody else all around the world. And we can't today. We have about 700 million people around the world that don't have access to that kind, that kind of energy. And so uh, the good news is that uh, renewable energy Uh, is actually cheaper than fossil fuel energy in most places in the world. 
Uh, and what we have to do is put a policy environment in place, which means that the investment flows into greener energy rather than into, uh, into polluting energy. And the Secretary General of the United Nations called today for an end to fossil fuel subsidies that are harmful. You can take those subsidies and apply them to people so that people have cash in their hands so that they can buy the clean, affordable energy that they want, including alternatives to kerosene for cooking. Um, and so these are, we call it a transition because you can't just stop one way of, of creating energy one day and start uh, another the next day. This is a transition, uh, weaning ourselves off uh, fossil fuels, weaning ourselves off the emissions that come from fossil fuels and exploiting the, the wind, the solar, the the geothermal, the hydropower, and then putting carbon capture on any remaining gas infrastructure. This is the way that Africa can, can grow. And all of the evidence is that it could grow uh, very green and very fast and very cheaply. Uh, but it's going to take political leaders to grasp uh, that opportunity and demand the investment flow into, into the continent in order to back them up. Well, uh, Rachel Kite is the Dean of Fletcher School at Tufts University in Boston. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.